Moms who know do less so they can focus on what matters most, taking care of themselves, their families, and living their God-given purpose. Moms who know are simplifying motherhood and focusing on the little things they can do that grow to have a huge impact. You are connecting with your family, your true self, and your purpose. You are a mom who knows. Thank you for joining me today on the Moms Who Know podcast. Today's episode with Erica Gwynn really is such a good story, and she shares her experience and her heart about her baby being born really premature, about her time in the NICU, about really what that looked like. I wanted to let you know right off the bat that this story has a happy ending. Her daughter is 18 months old now and doing really well, so I want to make sure that you knew that going in. I also want to let you know that today's episode has a sponsor. And in the past, I've done affiliates, but not sponsors. And so what this means is that if you listen, if you take the time to listen to um, the sponsorship information, then that counts for me and I get paid for that. And so I just wanted to thank you and let you know that doing that actually means something to me. So if you choose not to fast forward through the the sponsorship, then I get paid. So thank you for doing that. Before we get into that, I have one more announcement that I want to make sure that you know about. I have been working, this idea process actually started last August to put together a summit on finding your purpose. And the time is finally here to get registered for that. We have over 30 experts talking about finding and living their purpose. It is amazing you guys. It is a free resource for the the weekend of May 14th through 16th. You can listen to all of these presenters for free and really hone in on your own purpose. There's so much good stuff. So to get registered for the summit, you're going to go to momswhonowpodcast.com forward slash summit. You can sign up, get registered, and listen to all those uh, presentations for free. I highly recommend that you do. This is going to be so good, just so much valuable information for you. Now, today's show is sponsored by Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls podcast. I had mentioned that I've had opportunities in the past to do sponsorships, and I never really felt like it was a good fit until this. I feel so strongly about what they're doing. So Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls is a podcast that tells stories of amazing women and the things that they have done in their life. It talks about their careers. It talks about their service to humanity. There are so many women in this podcast that you really want your daughters to know about. In addition, the people who are actually reading the podcast and sharing this information are also amazing women. And it just is so powerful to to hear these stories. I think there's so much to be learned from biographies of anyone, but in particular, when we can expose our girls to powerful women doing powerful things, it helps them to know that yes, they can live their dreams. Yes, they should have the confidence to do anything they want to do because like these women, they have all that potential. And so it's a really powerful way to inspire both your girls and your boys. I think boys need to hear it just as much to know what women are capable of. So to inspire the rebel girl in your life, go and find Goodnight Stories for Rebel Rebel Girls on your favorite podcast player. Check it out. It's definitely worth your time, something that the whole family will enjoy listening to. And now let's get to today's episode with Erica Gwynn. Hello and welcome to the Moms Who Know podcast. I'm your host, Chanel Nielsen, and I'm joined today by Erica Gwynn. Erica, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. I am looking forward to this conversation and to learning more about you and about your story. And today we're really going to dive into um, your experience having your daughter, kind of a traumatic birth and early days experience. And I think that there's a lot to learn there. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that looked like for you and some of the things that you have learned from that that I think are really relevant and helpful to all moms who are going through things, which is 
all of us and can really help us to kind of connect with what we want the meaning of what we're going through to be, what we want that to look like for us. So before we get into that, Erica Gwynn is a business owner, mom, wife, and she's the founder of the blog Coming Up Roses. She has a podcast called Thrive Podcast where she pushes women to take action and to savor their lives. And she's also just come out with her first book called Caffeinate Your Soul, 52 Monday Mantras. So Erica is doing a ton of things, but she is also a mama of an 18-month-old. And we'd like to start there. Will you tell us a little bit about the birth of your daughter and that whole experience of having her? Sure. So, wow, that's, oh my gosh, it's so crazy even just kind of mentally transporting back to that time. Um, I basically thought my pregnancy was going as smooth as it possibly could be. I had no morning sickness, bless up to that. Um, I basically had what many would probably consider kind of like a dreamy pregnancy. So I never in a million years thought that it would go kind of horribly wrong towards the end. So basically around the 30 week mark, I went in for totally routine checkup and my OB was really alarmed, um, said I was measuring small. And at the time I had no idea what that meant. I had no idea what to expect, but they basically put me kind of on a high alert, high monitoring sort of situation where I was going in then for regular monitoring in the maternal fetal medicine ward. So my husband and I were nervous because that was way more of a just a high stress situation than what we were expecting, but we were doing whatever we had to do. So I was being monitored, being monitored. Everything was okay, moving along basically until it wasn't. So I went in for one of my routine appointments one morning thinking everything was okay, but I had felt a little bit lightheaded going into the appointment, which I didn't really think anything up at the time. I just kind of thought, all right, I feel a little weird. This is a kind of a strange pregnancy symptom, but what isn't strange in pregnancy is basically what right. I thought. <laughs> so I go in and they check my vitals and they check baby and then they do an ultrasound and the tech leaves the room and I'm waiting in the room for 45 minutes, which that length of time felt like an absolute eternity by myself in the little in the little room. And yeah. a hospitalist comes in next and said, listen, you are much sicker than you feel. Um, you are at risk of a seizure or a stroke or both today. So we need to take the baby out. And at this point, I was only 32 weeks pregnant. So I was mm -hmm. like, excuse me, what? Like, you need to take the baby out. Like, uh, that's not happening for another two months, buddy. Like, what are we doing? So he said, yep, um, you – we have to do it. Like, and I said, well, can we wait until tomorrow? <laughs> me being like total Enneagram 3, wanting to plan everything ahead. I was like, can we get this on the calendar first or is this like right now? <laughs> He was like, nope, this is happening now. It's happening as soon as an operating table opens up. Um, this is an emergency now. So I called my husband and I was like, babe, you got to come back to the hospital. Because he at that point had left to go to work thinking totally normal appointment. We'd be fine. Um, and my husband said, he's like, can I call you back in 10 minutes? I need to process this. I said, yep, no problem. Um, this is a biggie. And we just kind of started calling our family like, hey, emergency situation happening baby's coming today. So they told me I had severe preeclampsia basically. Um, and we ended up having the baby that day. I was 32, 32 weeks and six days. So as soon as she was born, they, um, put her in the NICU right away because I mean, she was born, she was three pounds, 0 0.1 ounces. So very, very tiny. Um, and she ended up going on to spend a total of 73 days in the NICU, which basically felt like another life, another lifetime. Um, and then she had a feeding tube for six months after that. So it was basically a, a whirlwind looking back, but in the moment, oh my God, it was the longest 73 days of our life. Um, and it was just a lot of praying and a lot of hospital visits and oh gosh, it was, it was crazy, but she's 18 months old now. So <laughs> happy ending to the story, but yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. I've heard the term preeclampsia, but I honestly don't know too much about it. Is that a condition of the mom? I know it's a pregnancy thing, but is it the mom or the baby? I don't know exactly what it is. The mom. Yeah. So baby was totally fine. Thankfully, it was literally, it was just me. So basically, um, oftentimes it happens later on in your pregnancy. Uh, typically, I think after about 20 weeks or so, um, but you have really high blood pressure is the kind of the, the okay. biggest characteristic of that. So if I remember correctly, I think my blood pressure was 180 over 120, which is like right at the risk of you're going to have a stroke or like you're something very – that's why they said it's – I had severe preeclampsia. They were like, yeah, we have to immediately put you – they put me on um, medication right away because they were like, this is bad. <laughs> and I called my mom who's a nurse and when I told my mom my blood pressure, she just about fainted on the other side of the phone because she knew exactly what was happening. She was like, oh my god, this is this is an emergency. So – yeah, the baby was baby was fine, but it was my blood pressure that was spiking so so severely. So and then you mentioned that the baby wasn't growing in the womb. Is that something that happens regularly with preeclampsia or was that a different issue? So I think they kind of went hand in hand. She was still growing. She was they just kept saying she was measuring small. So she was just she was on the petite side of things. But what they think ended up happening was they think my placenta basically ended up deteriorating prematurely. So they were looking at that and they were thinking that it was correlating to what was happening with my preeclampsia, where they were basically like, listen, this is kind of like a ticking time bomb inside of you where like the baby's gonna run out of nutrients or something really bad is gonna happen to you. And we don't really know what is going to come first. But with my being in the hospital and them tracking me the way they were, they were basically watching every single day, let alone week to week to see, okay, how long can we keep the baby inside? Because obviously goal would be (laughs) keep it in for as long as possible there until you're ready, until you're at full gestation. So that's, yeah, that was kind of, that was kind of where that was at. Yeah. Okay. That's so scary. I, I, in some ways, I think it's easier and in some ways harder that it was your first pregnancy. And let me explain what I mean by that. Like you kind of don't know what to expect with your first. And so it's almost like, oh, okay, this is what we're doing. And you don't know that this isn't normal yet. Um, I just say that because I had similar, I had with my fifth, um, we had issues when he was about about 32 weeks and he was measuring small and all ended up being fine with him. And I won't get into all that, but um, I remember like, okay, this is so different. They're very concerned. You know, that the medical mm-hmm. professionals try to play it cool, but you're like, okay, wait, I, I know <laughs> what's going on here. I've right. done this four other times. So um, taking yourself back, you know, what were, what was going through your mind? Obviously, it was sudden and you were just like shocked that your baby was coming right away. But what other, what other things were you thinking? What were some of your concerns at the time when you found out, okay, this baby is coming today? I was honestly just kind of in complete in shock. I mean, I had no idea what to expect. Um, I was definitely not expecting to have to have a C-section, but at that point, I I think I was kind of almost delusional at that point because I was just like, oh my gosh, dear God, let the baby be okay. You know, because mm-hmm. at that point, especially with it being my first baby, I didn't even know what babies look like in the womb at that at that age, you know? Yeah. Like I was like 32 weeks, is this like is this a pu- what fruit is coming out now? <laughs> like I was right. like, what, you know, they always compare <laughs> your baby to like what si- what kind of fruit yes. they are. I'm like, oh god, I don't even know if this is like a normal like a normal quote unquote looking baby that's going to come out. I'm like, I don't know if she's Gonna, I mean, they literally gave me a steroid shot in my butt right beforehand for her lungs. And I'm thinking like, oh wow. my God, how does this even work? Like you're gonna you're gonna inject me with something that's supposedly going to help her lungs because her lungs aren't even developed yet. Like what what are we doing? So at that point I was like, Jesus, take the wheel. I don't know what on earth is gonna happen next, but it's obviously completely out of my control. And I, I've always been someone that's kind of type A, likes to have control, likes to know what's happening next. So this was like completely new territory. I was just, I was kind of like, I mean, I was terrified, basically. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. the, 
the easy way to put that. Um, and we were just, my husband and I just had no idea what was going to come next. So we were kind of in, I don't know, we were just, I felt like the, our lives were in the doctor's hands, you know, we were just kind of like, all right, walk us through it and do the best you can, but we don't, we don't know what comes next. So this was new territory. Definitely. And then she was born and tell us about the experience of her being in the NICU. You said it was 73 days. Um, I've never had a baby in the NICU. I can only imagine how difficult that would be. Tell us what that was like. Yeah. So our NICU experience started off a little bit differently because for the first 30 days, um, she was in the NICU of the hospital that she was born at, which lucky for us was literally only five minutes from our house. So we kind of got into our first routine, which was just my husband would come home from work and we would head on over to the hospital, spend the whole evening there. We'd get to spend hours there with her, just kind of hanging out. And we got into this kind of comfortable routine being five minutes away. And it seemed, it seemed okay. And she seemed like she was stable and growing and having small milestones that were so different than the typical milestones that you think you're going to expect when you have, you know, when you have a baby, it was like, our milestones were like, oh, did she, you know, how much, how many milliliters did she get to take in a bottle? And we were talking like, five milliliters, which is so, so, so small. Mm. So it was, it was kind of just readjusting to all of that. And then I got to be around the 30 day point. Um, and they did her normal tests and she ended up having tests come back that show that came back positive for this really, really weird bacteria called Campylobacter, which really stumped the doctors because that's typically um, a bacterial strain that's basically never found in children, let alone newborns that had never left a NICU before. It comes predominantly from, um, I think it's undercooked poultry is where it kind of is originating usually. So everyone was like, wait, what? How is this baby have, have this bacteria? So the neonatologist saw that and that basically set off a five alarm NICU fire (laughs) where everybody was kind of panicking at that point, like what the heck is happening? So with when that kind of came back positive, she also had other symptoms where um, she was having these bradycardiac episodes where her oxygen levels would desaturate and her heart rate would um, accelerate. And it was basically a really bad combination where she could stop breathing and require stimulation to basically keep her conscious. So at that point, they made the decision that they couldn't have her in that NICU anymore. They said, basically, we can't, we're not equipped. This is kind of like a a more intense case and we have to transfer you. So they transferred us to one of the best children's hospitals basically in the world, which happens to be about an hour and a half from us. So we transferred then, um, and we were there for another month. And that one was a bit of a longer journey since it was – obviously, it was a longer commute for us. Um, and it, everything was just kind of felt more serious there. There were 100 beds in the NICU. So it was just you're surrounded by babies who just really need a lot of intensive care. And she was being tested for all sorts of crazy things. Um, And it was just – that one was – it was hard, you know? Like it was – you didn't even know what was happening half the time. Every There was a higher security levels where I had to call every single day and like prove that I was her mom to even be told updates on what was happening with her. And it was just like this crazy – crazy experience. And a lot of times they didn't know what was wrong with her. Um, If she she had different antibiotics that weren't necessarily working, Um, they've retested her for this bacteria and it tested negative this time. So then they were like, all right, we really don't know what's going on. Um, They gave her two blood transfusions. They had IV fluids, the whole nine yards. They basically had no clue what was what was actually the cause of everything. Um, So they were putting her on all sorts of different things. They ended up officially diagnosing her with central apnea and reflux. um, And they put her on caffeine for the apnea. They put her on Zantac for the reflux. um, And they, it was just a wild ride. And at one point they were going to transfer her back to the hospital that was closest to us. 
And literally 20 minutes after they called me to say she's she's approved for transfer back, they called me again and said, oh, just kidding. She needs to have a swallow study from the hospital here before we can before we can transfer her back. So they did that and they ended up seeing that she was aspirating from the reflux. Mm. So the fact that she was aspirating, they said, okay, we actually can't transfer her back um, because she may need an NG tube for feeding and the home hospital that they were going to be transferring her to wouldn't discharge babies with an NG tube. This hospital would. So they basically said, okay, just kidding. <laughs> We're going to keep her here. Um, and she's go- now going to be seeing the speech team and have to have this feeding tube situation because now we know that she's downing bottles and she's eating, but she's aspirating at the same time and she's aspirating silently. So she's at risk for developing pneumonia or some other issue from complications there. And she had to stay. So we ended up having that kind that kind of was the the foreboding cloud over the rest of our journey in the NICU too, because there were there were a lot of conflicting opinions with something like that. Um, and we had different speech therapists saying different things and recommending different things. And in a hospital of that size, it was also hard because they didn't have necessarily regular attention or regular eyes on them. And they didn't have the same eyes on them because the teams rotated all of the time. It was like a teaching hospital. So you would have, you would see three different teams seeing her in the course of one week. And by the time you saw the same face twice, a couple of weeks had gone by. So you kept having to remind people of who this baby was and what her situation was and what her case was like, because people didn't, you kept seeing completely new faces and everyone had a different opinion of how things should be treated. So um, we ended up having to just keep seeing everybody there and had to go um, five days without any bradycardia events before they would clear her for discharge. So if she could do that, she was like cleared to go, except the problem was she kept having these events and she might have one a day, but if it was one, it restarted her entire count over. So she would have an event go up. She even went, she got a couple of days and then an event. So it was like this constant, oh my God, heart wrenching thing of our hope getting brought up so high. Like, okay, she's doing it. She's, she's getting there. Like she's growing, she's improving. And then she would have one little event that would start the whole thing over. So, um, it was like constantly one step forward, a couple steps back And everyone just kept saying, she needs to outgrow it. She needs to outgrow it. And we were like, okay, well, what does that mean? Like, are we going to outgrow this in a couple of days or a couple of weeks? Or like, are we talking that we're living in the hospital for the first year of her life here? Like what? And no one could give us those answers. So it was like Uh. constantly our hopes being brought up and then being crushed down. And then us Googling things, which of course never made anything better. So um, yeah, it was just... It was a really long emotional journey. And by the time she went five days event free, it was like, we were like, oh my God, the clouds of heaven have opened (laughs) and we're free. (laughs) So eventually on, you know, 73 days later, we got the clear to go home and it was um, December 29th. So it was like right between Christmas and New Year's was when we got to take her home and she was born in October. Um, Wow. So yeah, it was. And then from that point, we had the feeding tube for another six months. So it felt like we could never really fully get away from the NICU and from everything that we went through there. But finally, she got the the NG tube out as well. So the journey continues. <laughs> but it was yeah. it was long. It was really, really long. So that is just so – I. I th- feel all the stress in that experience with the not knowing and with the, you know, trying to figure out the timing and trying to watch her and the the worry. And there's just so much for your baby in, in that experience. I want to take kind of a broader view and a step back to you and your husband. Obviously, you guys are focusing on her and her needs. What what did that look like for you? And how did you, you know, 
was it survival mode the whole time, the the 73 days and beyond? Because really, you know, they're with a feeding tube. It's not like you're out of the woods when she got out of the hospital, right? It, this right. is a long journey. So how were you able to just really kind of thrive in this experience? Yeah. So in the in the NICU itself, I think we were kind of more just in pure survival mode because, I mean, we were both – we were depressed. We were anxious. We were sad. And especially after being transferred too, we were just – we were constantly in the car, you know? Like our life was routinized in a negative sort of way. Um, but I think we were able to kind of elevate through that to – a little bit more of thriving just really by being really intentional and choosing our perspective through all of it. And oh my God, it was so hard in certain moments and I'll be the first one to admit that. Um, But we had to really find little joys and little blessings and little moments that we could latch onto to give us hope through all of it. Because otherwise we would, I mean, we wouldn't have made it in, out in one piece because just of what sort of emotional roller coaster it was. So it was like we we really had to be intentional with the way that we were crafting our days besides the NICU. <laughs> um, so like we tried to find every Netflix stand-up comedy special out there that could just make us laugh for a moment. Um, and like I, I got new Ugg moccasins just for our daily NICU travels to be more comfortable in winter, you know, like really just finding little things that we can look at and be like, you know what, this is nice. And for this moment, it's okay. And for this moment, I'm thriving and not just surviving because I'm making the best out of a really crappy deck of cards, basically. Um, And that was just what we kept having to do because we didn't know, you know, we didn't know how long it would be. We figured at some point she would come out, but the longer, the longer it went and the more days passed, we kind of started to doubt that too, where we were like, oh my God, could she be here for years? You know, like there's just so many issues. And it seems like as soon as we close one door of an issue, a new one pops up. So we were like, at what point is this actually going to end and be okay? So it was really just a matter of, finding little things that almost had nothing to do with the actual issue just to keep reminding ourselves that life is still good and that there are still good things out there to hold on to, to bring us joy. Um, even when the biggest and most important thing in our life was felt like it was falling apart. Yeah. So during that time, was it hard to like let go and not feel guilt was was there guilt that okay I'm not with my daughter every minute at the hospital and I'm here enjoying this show or you know buying myself comfortable boots was there any guilt associated with that oh my god all the time oh my gosh all the time it was especially in the second hospital they had a camera system set up so that you could, so that parents could basically tune in hypothetically at any point and check in on your baby. Because at this hospital, they had people coming in from across the world. So, I mean, there were families where they were from California and the hospital was in Pennsylvania and, you know, they just had to watch their baby on a video camera. And I, you know, somebody else gave her her first bath and I came in the next day and they were like, oh, she loved her bath. And it crushed me inside Mm. because someone else got to give my baby her first bath. And I would see other people snuggling my baby when she was upset. Or I would walk into the room and a volunteer was holding her and snuggling going, oh, she loves to snuggle. And I felt so much guilt over all of that because I would have lived there for that time with her if I could. And we couldn't do that. They kicked us out. There were only five rooms in the hospital that were like overnight rooms for parents. And they were reserved for the people who were traveling the farthest. There were 100 beds in the NICU. So, I mean, we were bed 98. So <laughs> there, the hospital was full of babies where the parents were, had to just come in and then say goodbye to your baby. And I would see her cry on the camera and I could count the seconds that it would take for someone to come to her bedside and help her. You know, or like I would see somebody else, the camera get pushed away when it was time to change a diaper because someone else was doing that too. So it was like every single moment I was like, oh my God, I I was afraid she wasn't going to know that I was her mom. You know, like my fear was like, what happens when she comes out and she doesn't even know who I am? We didn't, 
you know, like we didn't get to breastfeed normally or have a lot of skin to skin contact or like just have those moments of bonding. We did whatever we could in the short time that we were there. But if we were there for four hours in an evening and that time was split between me holding her and my husband holding her and then doctors coming to talk to us where neither one of us could be holding her, it was like, it was like, oh my God, I'm missing out on so many hours that would be in my head. I thought crucial to a bond that we could have together. And I felt like I would just have had to give this all up. And it was, I mean, honestly, it, it, it killed me inside for a really long period of time, really long period of time, because I was just constantly thinking like, I want to be doing so much more, but I can't, or could I? And it was like, you wrestle with all of that. You wrestle with all of it, you know, and then you're just watching, you're watching it all happen on a video screen in front of your face. And then you're dealing with your postpartum hormones on top of all of it. Yeah, yes. It was was a hot mess. Well, I appreciate you really opening up and sharing that because I think that that makes what you shared earlier even all the more poignant that you still chose to have those little moments. And I think that sometimes it's easy to think we can't have both. Like, well, I feel so guilty because I want to be here as a mom or I, you know, I want to do this, all of these things that I can't choose joy. And yet you, you did, it was hard. It was all the things and yet you still found those little moments. So I think that that is super powerful. I, there's so many more things that I want to know about your story, but we are about out of time. So I want to make sure that we talk about this. So today we've really talked about your story. We've talked about choosing to thrive um, even when things are hard. How does that help moms to simplify motherhood? I think it really comes down to the fact that motherhood in general is messy, especially as a new first-time mom. Like your emotional swings are strong and one day you feel on top of the world and the next you're crying on the bathroom floor just praying for a nap so you can take a shower. And I think – and the next you're feeling – guilty for even wanting to be away from your child ever. And then you find yourself staring at your baby while they sleep and they're wishing them awake because you miss them. And it's, it's a total emotional roller coaster. And I think that that kind of also ties into the whole surviving or thriving sort of concept because you can have both at the same time, you know? And if sometimes as a mom, you wake up and you have this mile long to-do list and you're lucky if one thing gets crossed off by lunch or some things, sometimes it's one thing crossed off all day long. So I think it helps us to just reframe our mindsets and really learn to adjust what we consider a success, which helps us kind of adjust what validates us at the end of the day too. Because at the end of the day, we don't necessarily need to have it all figured out or need to have an answer or need to feel totally good all the time for it to be okay and beautiful, this whole journey of motherhood that we're on. I think we just have to take that step back and allow ourselves to have both the positive and the negative emotions and experiences coexisting and acknowledging that, you know, that not trying to change that or fix it constantly in and of itself simplifies motherhood because it gives us back some of our sanity and it gives us back some of our time because we're not trying to just fix it or change it constantly. Oh, that's so good. I feel like so much of so much of it happens in our mind and it's a yeah. decision of what we're going to say, what we're going to allow and what we're going to choose to be enough. Like is are my efforts enough for today and if I decide that they are, they are. And that's as much as I need to know and that you're right. That just simplifies things really more than anything else could. So I love that perspective. Now, where is the best place for people to go and learn more? from you. Sure. My blog is cominguproses.theblog.com um, or you can find me on Instagram at Erica Legenza, L-I-G-E-N-Z-A um, or my book on Amazon is Caffeinate Your Soul. Awesome. Okay. Well, we will link to that and we always finish up with this question, which is this, what one little thing do you hope that people do and take action on because of the things that you've shared today? I think give yourself grace to know that some days are just survival mode and that's okay, but don't feel limited by that term either. Know that you can still thrive in survival mode and find 
the bless and the mess, so to speak, in whatever sort of new normal your life may be in at any given point in time, really. Just give yourself that grace and don't be afraid to give it time and time again. I love that. I think that's so good and so important for us to do. So Erica, thank you so much for the things that you've shared today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. And thank you everyone for listening to Moms Who Know. I loved hearing Erica's story and hope that you did too. I would love to know what stood out to you and what one little thing you are going to take action on because of hearing her story. Also, remember today to go to momswhoknowpodcast.com forward slash summit and get all the details about the Purpose Project. You don't want to miss this. It's coming up soon. So quickly get registered so you can listen to all these amazing presentations and we will see you guys next time. Next time.